Hello everyone, I'm Benjamin Anthony, co-founder of the Miriam Institute, the premier international forum for Israel-focused dialogue, discussion and debate. You can follow our work at www.miriaminstitute.org. As ever, I'm extremely grateful and appreciative to JBS for broadcasting our programming. In this episode, we assess Israel's geostrategic positioning. Joining me for that conversation was a retired officer from the Israeli Defense Forces Intelligence Corps, Lieutenant Colonel Yochai Gwiski. And he was in conversation with our in-house analyst at the Miriam Institute, Yaakov Lapin. They spoke about Israel's internal, immediate, regional and international challenges and opportunities. It makes for a fascinating conversation, and I hope you enjoy the discussion as much as I did. And as ever, I encourage you to invest in the important work of JBS. Thank you, and enjoy the program. Let's dive right in uh, to our questions today. Please define for us very, very clearly what it is that you mean when you use the term Israel's geostrategic positioning. So, Yaakov, let's have a tight definition from you, and then Yochai, the same from you. Okay, so if we break down the term geostrategic, we're talking about uh, geography uh, and the way that it's applied in terms of its influence um, on the geography of a country. Um, And it's this combination of a country's geographical conditions and the way they influence uh, that country's ability uh, to implement its foreign policy, whether that's uh, military or political or diplomatic, that sum total, that wide picture is how I would define uh, a geo strategy. And Yochai, what's your take on that term? Well, I, I take it uh, from, uh, from strategic studies. Uh, you talk about um, the, real, the realist uh, approach uh, to uh, international affairs. So it is the power that Israel holds in order to influence what happens to it and where it is in relation to other countries. So its geostrategic uh, positioning means how does it uh, relate to other countries in the terms of power, which means that economic, it takes uh, uh, strategic uh, influence, uh, technology, and militarily, uh, deterrence, all these components of uh, of power, according to the realist uh, 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 view of uh, nat- international relations. Wonderful. So I can see we're going to get two very different insights on the same topic, and that's what we like to, to have here. Uh, I would like to proceed in the following manner, which is that to, I'd like to begin with those states and non-states that share a border with the states of Israel, and then gradually pull back the lens from there. So with that having been said, said let's begin with the Gaza Strip. Uh, I would like you, please, to assess Israel's position vis-a-vis the Gaza Strip. We had a further round of conflict in May of this year. It never feels as though the next round of conflict is too far away in the distance. Israel was targeted by close to 4,500 rockets during that campaign. I'm referring to Operation Guardian of the Walls. So my questions are, number one, what will yield continuing calm and what will result in a flare-up of hostilities? with regard to the Gaza Strip. And the second question is that there is an ongoing debate as to whether or not Gaza represents a strategic threat to the states of Israel. What is your view on that question? Is it or is it not a strategic threat? And Yochai, I'm going to come to you first of all, and you can answer those questions in whichever order you like. Um, is it a strategic threat? Um, most definitely. Um, when you have something of a military threat that is so close to your uh, hinterland, to your uh, strategic uh, uh, assets uh, that can influence at any time, at any place, uh, uh, your your politics, uh, your economics, uh, uh, the ability of uh, the military to to act. Uh, It can be a second front uh, if something happens, God forbid, in Lebanon or Iran or something else. So it is most definitely a strategic threat to Israel. Um, and it is, uh, if, if I may relate to the first question, it is 
it is unstable. It is it is inherently unstable. So uh, Israel is trying to try. What can I say? Calm the situation down. A situation which is uh, inherently turbulent. You have a, 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 a population, a large population, uh, in a in a status of constant humanitarian strife under the control of a Taliban-like uh, uh, entity, uh, which controls every facet of their lives. Uh, 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 and then uh, it has to try and uh, help that, that population, uh, provide them with, with uh, electricity, water, uh, provide them with uh, uh, the, the humanitarian needs that pass through Israel into Gaza, while dealing with uh, uh, a terror attacks from that territory by Hamas, by Palestinian Islamic Jihad, and by other terror groups, uh, some of them affiliated with ISIS, uh, some of them affiliated with Iran. So uh, uh, it's, it's, it's inherently unstable. Uh, so Israel is trying to use all um, a whole of government approach, trying to use economic carrots and sticks, trying to use uh, uh, international aid to come into that area, trying to convince Hamas to make uh, short-term or long-term deals on stabilizing the situation and trying to avert uh, 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 another uh, military crisis there uh, that could uh, happen at any moment, at any time, uh, unfortunately, because of that, that inherent instability. Um, some, it, it can be caused by Iran, it can be caused by something in the Palestinian arena, it can be caused by a miscalculation when, when Hamas or someone else tries uh, uh, to do something and uh, doesn't understand what it means to Israel, or it can uh, be a mistake, be a, a missile hitting a kindergarten and you're at war. So Yaakov, you know, I, I'm actually surprised by Yochai's response, not because Yochai has changed his position. I think it's the first time I've asked him whether he views Gaza as a strategic threat. But I know that it's oftentimes been the case that people have said that Gaza is categorically not a strategic threat. I've long thought that Gaza is a strategic threat. I've thought that for years. I've spoken to you about it. What do you think has happened to shift the mind from looking at Gaza as a tactical challenge that needed to be managed to now hearing more and more voices such as those of Yochai saying it is a strategic threat? That's my first question. And then going off what Yochai said about needing to keep the, calm, the, the situation calm, but always readying yourself for a response that can escalate things. Tell us about some of the regional players, the Qataris, for example, came to mind, that Israel works with, collaborates with, in order to keep things simmering, but perhaps not boiling over in the Gaza Strip. And, and how right. tenable are those connections? So I think um, Yochai really put his finger on it. The ability of the Gaza Strip to influence immediately the routine situation of the state of Israel, uh, to place uh, central Israel and its millions of citizens in the economic hub uh, in a standstill situation because of its arsenal of rockets means that Gaza is by definition a strategic threat. And any territory that can do that um, is by definition a, a strategic issue and not a tactical one, not one that only affects a small part of the country. Um, I think that um, when it comes to Gaza, one of the problems that we have here in Israel is definitions. Uh, what is Gaza? What is Hamas? We haven't really actually made up our minds about how we define that. And I would propose that Gaza and Hamas, uh, you, we can call it Hamastan, is in many, many ways, it's a de facto state. It answers so many of the parameters that a state has. It has its own government, it has its own armed forces, which are also terrorists because they're hybrid, they're, they're part uh, military in terms of their hierarchy, they're part guerrilla, and they're, and they're part terrorists in terms of their dedication to uh, harming and killing uh, Israeli civilians. So we have this hybrid uh, um, uh, military force. We have an independent political Islamist government. This is a Muslim Brotherhood sovereignty project. That is how I view uh, uh, the Gaza Strip. It's, it's really an experiment by the Muslim Brotherhood to see if they can set up and maintain a state. And because uh, Hamas itself pursues these multiple uh, objectives, on the one hand, setting up a, a sovereign state, but on the other hand, committed to its ideology of unending conflict with Israel. And, and ultimately, you know, we have to 
I think it always has to be said when we're talking about Hamas. Hamas's long-term objective is to destroy the state of Israel and replace it with an Islamic state. So strategically, that is where it's committed to. But tactically, it is uh, um, willing to enter long periods of ceasefires so long as it can exploit those truces to its ends. Um, so what we're stuck with is a constant balancing act by both sides. Hamas is looking to give its people some time to recover from rounds of war, but it insists that it's able to continue building up its force, these rockets that turn it into a strategic threat. And Israel also is pursuing these sort of two wants, right? On the one hand, it's uh, a desire to maintain long periods of common routine. It's good for the economy. It's good for society. But on the other hand, interfering with Hamas's force buildup process and not letting it build this huge arsenal of rockets, which Israel did unfortunately do. Uh, and this May conflict that we just uh, experienced recently was a demonstration that Israel did not get this balance right. Um, so I think, you know, uh, I'll probably I'll stop there to let the conversation continue. But I think, you know, we have to get clear on definitions and, and, and what we're looking at when we're talking about Hamas on the Gaza Strip. But I do want you to come back, Yaakov, just a little bit with some of the regional players that have been yep. uh, worked with, uh, collaborates with, coordinates with by Israel, reluctantly in most cases, in order to keep okay. simmering but not boiling over. Just give us a two, three sentence yep. overview of that. Okay, so there is a uh, sort of coalition that's acting for stability in this region, each for their own interests. And, and the main uh, party here is Egypt. Egypt is the one that's mediating these attempts to form a long-term arrangement that will uh, stabilize the Gaza Strip. Uh, Egypt is deeply concerned by the uh, conflict that could spill over from Gaza to the Sinai, where it's dealing with a jihadist insurgency. I mean, it wants Gaza uh, stable and quiet. Um, and as a result, it also wants to uh, uh, display its centrality as, as a central Arab actor, um, both to the region and to the Biden administration, which has taken a very critical role of, of the uh, LCC administration. So it has multiple reasons to try and show that it can really influence the Gaza Strip. And I think that recently it's demonstrated that it can influence the Gaza Strip because it has uh, used its crossing with Gaza, the Rafah border crossing, to um, uh, inject into Gaza some of the things that Hamas is demanding that come in, reconstruction material, road material, uh, construction material, infrastructure. Some of these things are our core Hamas demands. So that has helped stabilize Gaza. And I think what's interesting here is that uh, Egypt is increasingly acting as a sort of bypass mechanism when Israel and, and Hamas get stuck um, because Israel has its own demands of Hamas uh, to release uh, the remains of two uh, soldiers uh, who were killed in action and two civilians who are being held uh, by uh, Hamas. And until that happens, uh, it's not going to uh, open up Gaza fully as much as it can. So Egypt is stepping in here as a sort of bypass mechanism, and that's helping to stabilize the situation. Um, and Qatar, uh, for its own interests, um, is acting really as the cash machine here. Qatar is funding uh, many of uh, the core civilian needs of the Gaza Strip. Um, and currently it's in talks with Hamas about how it can fund its uh, uh, government officials, approximately 30,000 government officials. So what we're seeing is, is, a, is, is a, are, are a coalition of actors coming together to uh, answer Hamas's core needs. And Israel is cooperating with this in order to promote its own interest in stability. Uh, and Qatar and Egypt are the two main players. There are others, but those are the two main players um, that I would, I would uh, point out here. Thank you very much, Yaakov. So let's, add, yes, we have another right. major one, uh, the Palestinian Authority, which uh, has been um, unfortunately trying to destabilize the Gaza Strip uh, over the last uh, few years. Uh, cutting off money to uh, the strip, cutting off uh, the money for uh, government uh, employees, and increasing the pressure on Hamas, and by that, uh, destabilizing uh, the Gaza Strip. So let's move northward now. And I, I said I'm going to try and get all of this done swiftly, but your answers are certainly helping all of us to understand the region already. I want to move directly to Lebanon. Uh, I mentioned in, a, in the previous question that during Operation Guardian of the Walls, Israel was the target of close to 4,500 rockets. I mentioned that number again because it provides context for just how foreboding the situation in southern Lebanon is for the state of Israel. 
The current commander of the Home Front Command, General Ori Gordon, recently came out with a statement that said the following. He said that during Operation Guardian of the Walls, quote, cities like Tel Aviv and Ashdod experienced the highest number of fire toward them in the history of the state of Israel. We saw a pace of more than 400 rockets fired toward Israel on a daily basis. And then he went on to say that in a future conflict or a war with Hezbollah, we, Israel, expect more than five times the number of rockets fired every day from Lebanon to Israel. Basically, he said, we are looking at between 1,500 and 2,500 rockets being fired daily toward the state of Israel from southern Lebanon. Now, Yochai, there is massive, massive instability in that country, in addition to the threats that I just delineated. Tell us about the source of that instability and tell us also how prepared Israel is for the prospect of facing up to 2,000 rockets per day being fired at our citizens. The instability in Lebanon is a long-term uh, project. Uh, some of it is uh, basically the fact that uh, Hezbollah is a major player there. It uh, makes politics in Lebanon uh, untenable. Uh, it always uh, it, it always uh, has veto power uh, if it if it is uses its political or its military might uh, in order to prevent uh, any action that might. Um, in any way uh, prevent it from uh, using its, uh, its influence in Lebanon or getting it, its, uh, its funds uh, through. Uh, we can all remember what happened uh, in 2007, if I am not remember, when uh, they closed down Beirut because someone was trying to replace the officer that was uh, in charge of the Beirut uh, airport. Uh, and uh, he was the one that uh, was looking the other way when uh, Hezbollah uh, was getting its money or anything else through the Beirut uh, airport. So uh, this this has been a long uh, simmering uh, problem that has destabilized and made Lebanon, uh, I would say, a failed state uh, at every turn. And and uh, what has exacerbated it are three things. One, the explosion in the Beirut uh, port, which has uh, instantly uh, vaporized uh, an entryway and, e and a major economic uh, uh, way and port uh, to, to the Lebanon system. So it, it immediately increased the cost to every Lebanese uh, because uh, now uh, they had to reroute how uh, supplies and how trade is done with, with the state. Uh, the second thing is uh, the increased pressure by the United States on the financial system in Lebanon and in Syria. Uh, those two are connected. Uh, Syria has been uh, using Lebanon to funnel money uh, to the Syrian regime. And as uh, the pressure cranked up on, on Syria uh, because of the Caesar Act, uh, the pressure cranked up on Lebanon as well. Uh, and the third thing is that Hezbollah itself uh, uh, will... Uh, became far more active uh, and involved in what happened in uh, in Syria, and uh, that in itself, uh, and in and with the war uh, with ISIS, uh, and that in itself created more tensions within the state. Uh, its involvement, it's uh, in in the war in Syria, which is very unpopular with uh, some uh, uh, Lebanese, uh, and uh, the fact that ISIS came back and and attacked. Uh, Lebanese citizens because of it, uh, all three are, uh, are a part of how uh, unstable the state is and how prepared Israel. I would say that Israel is as prepared as it, as it can be to such, a, to such a, an eventuality. Uh, you can always be more prepared. Uh, we, are, we have Iron Dome. We could, use, we could use more Iron Dome systems. We can use more interceptors. Uh, but uh, I believe that the IDF uh, uh, can do what needs to be done, which is to rain havoc on, uh, on, uh, on Lebanon and try and suppress uh, that fire. Will it uh, bring calm and, and make everything okay? No, but uh, the Lebanese and everyone else that is uh, employing Hezbollah uh, against Israel would uh, learn their lessons. Yaakov, I'm going to shift to Syria, but before I do, and I'm going to pose the, the Syrian question to you, do you have anything to add there to what Yochai just said with regard to Lebanon? 
Uh, sure. Uh, just quickly, I think that because, you know, Hezbollah is, is, is an Iranian proxy, and this comes back to the question of uh, geo strategy, because Iran is in Lebanon and Iran is in Syria, and it's also uh, influencing the Gaza Strip, and it's no longer possible in, in, in the year of 2021 to separate these first, second, and third circles because Iran and this axis is, is playing uh, a multi-regional game here. Um, we have to also look at what Hezbollah's role is according to the Iranian game plan. And my understanding is that Hezbollah's primary role today is to deter Israel from attacking Iran's nuclear program. That is its first mission. And there are, of course, other missions that it has. Um, it could be brought into uh, uh, play in all sorts of other escalations. But I think that that's the primary mission that the Iranians have set for it. And as a result, um, they're not going to try and activate Hezbollah so quickly. Um, I agree that any sort of match can light the fire. That's the situation that we're in. Um, but I think that really it's it's not possible to separate uh, uh, that role that Iran has, has given to Hezbollah from the question of Iran's nuclear program and Israel's options. So I'm just throwing that into the mix. Thank you. So on to Syria. You know, Yaakov, you and I have spoken about this. Yochai, I, I haven't yet spoken to you about this at length, but I think you probably know my opinions from the article with which you disagreed uh, that I penned. I have a deep sense of frustration about what I perceive to be extreme hesitancy on the part of the Israeli government and the defense establishment to proactively seek out and destroy capabilities of Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad in Gaza and Hezbollah in Lebanon. But one area wherein that charge of hesitancy cannot really be leveled is in Syria. Israel is determined to control and degrade the capabilities sent by Iran into Syria and potentially onward to Hezbollah. We're acting to interdict weapons systems and capabilities on a very, very frequent basis. And so, Yaakov, I'd like you to tell us, please, specifically what it is that Israel is continuing to disrupt in Syria and how effective our efforts are being shown to be. And also, if I may ask you, how long do you think that policy can continue to be effective there? Isn't the clock going to run out eventually? Yeah, and it's very interesting that you asked that question, I think very correctly, in relation to Lebanon, because I think one of the things that really jolted Israel into starting to take this kind of proactive action, which it calls the campaign between the wars, which really got going in, in 2013, approximately two years after uh, the Iranians got involved in Syria and started uh, entrenching themselves there, was the understanding that between 2006, between the end of the Second Lebanon War time and uh, 2011, approximately, uh, Israel missed an opportunity to stop Hezbollah's force buildup. And it was that realization that we, that you know, we can't make this mistake again in Syria. We can't let a Hezbollah 2.0 or, or worse uh, set up shop in Syria that I think really jolted the defense establishment and the government uh, into that willingness. And I think it's, a, it, it's an excellent policy uh, in Syria. It's a proactive policy. Um, it really, it's very responsive to what the Iranians have been trying to do. So you can divide it into phases, say between 2011 and approximately uh, excuse me, 2013 and approximately 2015, 2016. During that phase, my understanding is that the Iranians had very ambitious programs for Syria. And I'm talking about uh, deploying their own military forces. Uh, I'm not even talking about proxies. I'm talking about uh, naval bases, air force bases, ground, ground forces. They wanted all of that in Syria. And when is Israeli uh, reported strikes started coming in, they realized, and this is a strategic change on their part, that that plan is, is simply not going to be allowed to happen. And they shifted uh, gear and they uh, decided to try and be more covert, the Iranians, and build a second Hezbollah. And this is really about arming their thousands of Shiite uh, uh, militia members who are in Syria. These are divisions that are, are coming in from Pakistan, uh, from Afghanistan, a little bit also from Iraq. 
um, and arming them with rockets. They wanted to arm them with thousands of rockets um, and threaten Israel with those and really establish a second Hezbollah. And when that happened, uh, the Israeli defense establishment uh, shifted its own campaign to disrupt that kind of action. In terms of how effective it is, it's hard, of course, to know without you know knowing the intelligence, but it appears, and I think it's safe to assess, that uh, the plan that the Quds Force commander uh, Soleimani had uh, for Syria has not been implemented successfully. They don't have a second Hezbollah in Syria. Uh, they do have capabilities, military capabilities that are disturbing in Syria, but not at the quantity and the level that the Iranians would have wanted to. Um, and that means that the campaign has been at least partially successful. Um, is it a, a long-term solution? I don't think it is, because the long-term solution is for Iran to get out of Syria. And there are many ways we can talk about that if we have time, how that might happen. Um, but for the time being, I don't see any other option but for Israel to continue to mow the lawn in Syria, as it, as it were, and to strike those capabilities uh, when it sees them and not to allow either the Iranians to entrench themselves in Syria or to transit uh, advanced capabilities uh, via Syria into Lebanon. Both of those things are being stopped. So let's talk a little bit about uh, Iran. So, Because after all, as, as Yaakov expressed, it is in no small part Iran with whom we are doing battle in Syria, if I can put it like that. And, and a rather audacious attack was carried out on a military base inside Syria used by the US-led coalition that is charged with battling back against and countering ISIS over there. Uh, this attack took place a week after pro-Iranian forces vowed that a strong response would come as a result of a US-led attack alleged to have been launched from that base. The reports about this stated that a military outpost in southern Syria used by US troops and its allies was hit by a coordinated attack on Wednesday a week after pro-Iranian militias vowed revenge for an alleged Israeli-American strike near Palmyra. A U.S. official said that no American troops stationed at the base near Syria's borders with Iraq and Jordan were injured or killed, but several blasts were heard from the base. So, Yochai, is Iran ratcheting up that which it is prepared to do in the region, and does this attack indicate that preparedness to step up the direct nature in which it's prepared to counter, uh, have a conflict with, interface with, and attack uh, U.S. forces? This is a very good question. And uh, this, because this is, uh, this is something that the Iranians rarely did before. Uh, th they had attacked the base uh, previously unsuccessfully. Uh, they did it regularly in Iraq. Uh, so th they're, they're unafraid of attacking uh, uh, American forces in, in the region uh, in multiple ways. Um, the question is, what is Iran uh, trying to, who is Iran trying to hit? Uh, why is it doing it? And uh, what, what's its end game? Is it trying to get uh, uh, the U.S. Uh, out of uh, Syria? And the question is, are they trying to influence the Biden administration uh, when it is leaving Afghanistan? and uh, uh, rather uh, unceremoniously, uh, and uh, it's committed to leaving Iraq, and they're trying to influence it to leave uh, Syria as well. Uh, it's a good question, uh, and whether they think that this is uh, going to influence someone, whether it is uh, going to do something uh, that helps them on, its, on their way, or is it just another way to harass the Americans as part of uh, the greater plan of, of, uh, of attacking and uh, cost uh, in increase uh, to the American forces in the region and uh, the allies of, of uh, the, the, the anti-Iranian coalition. Uh, they have attacked ships uh, in various places. Uh, they have uh, launched drones at Saudi Arabia. Uh, they have attacked the UAE. So, uh, it could be a part of the larger campaign, and it could be something that is specific to the Americans. I, 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 I don't know which one uh, is it. Uh, but uh, the Iranians are bolder uh, at, the, at the moment, at the, the last year, uh, at what they do, uh, reacting or 
initiating against Israel, against the UAE, uh, against Saudi Arabia, even though they are uh, now uh, having talks with Saudi Arabia uh, uh, in Iraq. So um, uh, I don't know which one is it, but whatever it is, it shows that the Iranians are, are willing to act, are willing to shape the area through action. And this is something that Israel has been doing in Syria, shaping through action, uh, while the Americans have been shaping through inaction, uh, mostly, uh, and by uh, leaving areas. Uh, that is the situation right now. I think they're trying to make uh, the Americans leave uh, TANF, um, but I don't know if that is uh, something that they will succeed. So, Yaakov, I, I just want to give credit to you, as, as is often the case. You know, you saw that story and shoved it proverbially under my nose. You sent it to me over over WhatsApp. So thank you very much for doing that and, and allowing us to enrich the conversation by way of it. I'm now going to come to you about your man, uh, Lieutenant General Chief of the General Staff, Aviv Kochavi. Uh, I know that you are something of a fan of Kochavi and his writings and his musings and his speeches and, and his role as the Chief of Staff. So uh, this question is about hitting Iran's nuclear capabilities. Uh, Israel Israel has approved a budget of 5 billion shekels, 1.5 billion US, to be used to prepare the military for a potential strike against Iran's nuclear program. The 5 billion shekel budget is made up of 3 billion shekels from the previous budget and, an, and, an, and an additional 2 billion from the next budget slated to be approved, let's hope, by the government in November. Uh, and here's the point. It includes funds for various types of aircraft, intelligence gathering drones, and unique armaments needed for such an attack, which would have to target heavily fortified underground sites, such as those that we associate with Iran's nuclear program. Uh, the report of this increased budget came days after the US Air Force announced that it had carried out a successful test of its new bunker buster, the GBU-72 Advanced 5K Penetrator. Uh, that 5,000 pound bomb can be used as a tool to strike Iranian nuclear sites. And here to come to General Kochavi, last month, he told Wala News in Israel that Israel has greatly accelerated preparations for action against Iran's nuclear program. He went on to say that a significant chunk of the boost to the defense budget was intended for the purpose of striking Iran. It's a very complicated job with much more intelligence, much more operational capabilities, much more armaments required, and we are working on all these things. That's what Kochavi had to say about it. So my question to you, Yaakov, and I'm sure you know what it is, is to strike or not to strike? Where are Israel's strategic alliances on this front? I personally think it's a very mixed message that we're getting on the international arena. If there is a strike, can you assess the involvement of the UAE and Saudi Arabia in particular across any sector, whether it be kinetic, direct, intelligence sharing, landing, any of that stuff? Uh, I recently spoke Yaakov to Yaakov Perry, the former head of the Shin Bet, and he was definitively resigned to the idea that Iran would soon gain nuclear military capabilities. But I also spoke to Secretary Mike Pompeo uh, during a recent event at which we hosted him, and he was adamant that Iran's nuclear ambitions can be countered, including militarily. What are your thoughts? I think in terms of the... Um uh, Kohavi's um, mentioning of the acceleration and, and being very public about it. Um, that is happening because Iran is accelerating its nuclear program. When Iran accelerates its, its activities, and particularly we're talking about fissile material and, and uranium enrichment, and, and they are more advanced now in terms of the uranium enrichment than they've ever been, um, that creates automatically a parallel accelerated capability de development in Israel for striking uh, uh, those, those targets, those sites. Um, now, there's a very big difference, of course, between uh, uh, force buildup and force activation. And obviously, obviously, Israel does not want to enter into uh, this kind of confrontation if it can avoid it. Um, so 
you know, in terms of what I can see happening on the ground and in terms of uh, um, Israeli contacts with the United States, because really it's the United States as 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 uh, Israel's number one ally and number one superpower, and still the superpower that is absolutely the most active and influential in the region, even if they don't want to be, and even if they're drawing down. Um, Israel is doing everything it can to coordinate with the United States and to transmit its position to it, which is that a return to the JCPOA, the 2015 deal, is a bad idea. Uh, If we look at the Iranian progress that has been made in the past year and a half, it's almost pointless uh, from the Israeli perspective to go back uh, to that agreement. And Israel's first preference is uh, to uh, encourage the United States and the international community to reach a bigger, better, longer deal, which would push Iran back, not by three, four, five, uh, seven, eight years, but by uh, dozens of years. Now, how possible is that? We don't know. Um, uh, We really just don't know. Um, But that is Israel's first preferred option. Now, in terms of uh, uh, the military uh, capabilities, that plays two roles, right? Right now, it influences uh, the pressure that's on Iran. Um, The more the Israeli military threat is credible, the more likely it is that the Supreme Leader Khamenei and the other decision makers in Iran will take that into account despite their bravado. I think they take that those kinds of threats very seriously. Um, and that can influence for the better attempts by the United States and the international community to get Iran back to the negotiation table. Um, if those negotiations keep stalling and the Iranians keep enriching uranium, um, and I'm not talking about tomorrow or next week, but I'm talking about the next six to 12 months, if the status quo uh, stays as it is, then it becomes an acute crisis situation and, and Israel would have to consider activating that force. Um, And in terms of your question of what would happen after a strike, first of all, I think nobody knows. Nobody knows. It's such a dynamic situation. There are multiple contingencies. Would we enter a state-on-state war situation, which we have not been in for a very long time, with Iran? Um, Highly likely that the Iranians will retaliate fiercely, uh, at least with their own uh, uh, missile and drone strike capabilities. And then comes the question of how many of their proxies would they activate? And And the really big question is, what would Hezbollah's role be in this in this retaliation? Will it automatically lead to a regional all out war or not? And I think that the IDF is planning for multiple contingencies, the most severe of which is a multiple front war involving uh, Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, the entire Shiite axis, the Gaza Strip could be dragged into that kind of, this is the worst case scenario. Um, So these are the things that are being planned and thought out with a lot of uncertainty. And um, in terms of your question of, of, um, you know, should or shouldn't it strike, I think when there is absolutely no uh, time left, when if if waiting further means an Iranian nuclear breakout, in my opinion, uh, allowing Iran to become a nuclear armed state is is uh, an intolerable scenario and one that would be worse than regional war. And I would give two quick reasons for that. First of all, uh, it would enable the Iranians to provide a nuclear shield, a nuclear umbrella for their various proxies. And if we think that they're being provocative and destabilizing now, how would uh, Hezbollah and, and Hamas and the Shiite militias in Syria and Iraq behave when they have a nuclear shield over them? What would the escalation dynamic look like there? And second of all, I think the fact that the Sunni states who are deeply alarmed by the Iranian nuclear program, and I think all of the negotiations between the Saudis and the Iranians, they're an expression of Saudi uneasiness in terms of how America might not be able to back them up. But I don't think we should make any mistake here. Saudi Arabia views Iran as its number one threat, uh, enemy, arch rival. It's just simply being uh, pragmatic and trying to de-escalate with these talks. But uh, I think once Iran becomes a threshold or a nuclear state, the Sunni states will follow suit. Saudi Arabia, uh, other countries in the region, uh, Egypt um, and the Gulf countries, I think they will want their own nuclear weapons. And even if it takes them a long time, getting to a situation where the Middle East, the world's least stable uh, region, is armed with nuclear weapons is simply an intolerable 
uh, a situation for a long-term future. And I'll just come to your last question. Would the, would the Sunnis uh, take part in a, in a strike in Iran? I don't think they would. I don't think they can be expected or we should expect them to take an active offensive part. But I think they behind the scenes, you know, allowing jets to fly through airspace, intelligence sharing, you know, that kind of support, I think, is, 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 is very reasonable to expect. But I wouldn't expect them to, to go to war with Israel uh, against Iran. So Yochai, in, 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 addition, in addition to adding anything you might like to add to Yaakov's response there, I want to move you on to the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. Quite simply, the issue of Iran uh, raises the dependability of the word of the United States of America from the Israeli perspective. And there are many who question the durability of that word following the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. Uh, several did so hysterically, in my opinion. Others did so in an understated fashion. Uh, but there was certainly a questioning of that. What do you think are the implications of the U.S. withdrawal from uh, Afghanistan for Israel and for the region in the context of a potential strike on Iran's nuclear capabilities? Again, a very good question. Uh, the The issue of uh, of the Afghanistan withdrawal is has several facets. One, it means to the Iranians and to others that you can uh, eventually win out against the, the United States. You can hold out, you can hit them, and they'll eventually give up. Uh, that is not a good message. Uh, to someone that is acting like Iran is, building up uh, uh, proxies that hit Americans, that hit American allies, and try to, uh, all, all, let us say, uh, over time, uh, get to victory, not, not uh, get to a, to a war situation. It shows that that kind of strategy can work. Uh, and it's not a good message uh, uh, because of that. But uh, on the other hand, the United States uh, has shown that when it wants something like getting out of Afghanistan, it does it and it, it doesn't matter the consequences. So uh, when the United States is saying now we will not let Iran acquire a nuclear weapon, you can say that the Americans do what uh, is necessary or what they think that is in their interest, no matter what anyone else is, is thinking. Uh, I know this is uh, clutching at straws right now, uh, giving that interpretation of, uh, of the situation. Uh, but Iran really has only one thing to consider. Uh, and it relates to your other question. Uh, when it looks at war with Israel, I don't think that Iran is particularly uh, um, concerned about Israel or uh, what uh, the UAE or even Saudi Arabia can do to it. It's a huge country, a huge population, and no one's gonna conquer uh, uh, Iran or do something. The question is, will the United States get involved when, when something like that uh, happens? And when the United States uh, seems uh, to be uh, not so interested in uh, getting into new wars in uh, the Middle East, uh, the Iranian may breathe a bit easily uh, on that front. This is why when uh, uh, Naftali Bennett, uh, the prime minister, went uh, to meet uh, uh, President Biden, he told him that uh, what Israel prefer is uh, a strategy of death by a thousand paper cuts. Let's harass Iran. Let's, uh, let's take it out uh, a bit by bit and not let it uh, go forward and increase the costs of uh, what it's doing. And by that, uh, make Iran understand that even if it tries to get to a nuclear weapon, it might not uh, be able to do so, not because of a huge strike by Israel or the United States, but because there are a lot of little things that we can do to deny it that uh, capability. And whatever it does, we will frustrate it. Uh, I think that Israel has done, uh, has been very successful at that. Uh, the assassination of Fakhri Zadeh, uh, um, mysterious explosion at, uh, uh, at sites that are related to the nuclear program, uh, has shown Iran that it is not as invulnerable as it uh, might want to be. 
so that is the alternative uh, route to making Iran. It is the Mabam uh, of, uh, against Iran, harassing it, taking out it cap- its capabilities, and uh, having a big hammer at the end, uh, which uh, the IDF chief of staff uh, was alluding to uh, in, with an attack, but making sure that along the way, Iran would suffer uh, a lot of setbacks uh, if uh, and when it tries uh, to get uh, to a nuclear uh, capability uh, uh, along the way. So, Jakob, I'm just going to ask you to unmute yourself, if, if you can, please. And uh, just, Yochai used the phrase Mabam. Can you just explain Mabam for our listeners, please, so that everybody knows in this world filled with acronyms, uh, military acronyms, tell us about Mabam, because you referenced it earlier in the conversation, of course. Sure. It's the campaign between the wars, and it's really become Israel's go-to um, f- military uh, tool for disrupting the force buildup of adversaries without crossing the threshold into war. This is the balance uh, that we're talking about, and it, it's really an incredible project. I mean, when you step back and look at it, it relies on the most high-quality intelligence and larger numbers of personnel who sit around day and night analyzing real-time intelligence and and red flagging um, developments that are clearly uh, a threat to Israeli security, and then and then bringing that up to the discussion of do we act now? Do we map it out for strikes later? And this constant sort of uh, uh, um, deliberation and monitoring, and then taking selective kinetic action uh, to disrupt this kind of activity. And I think that uh, you know other ways of calling it would be gray zone military activity, any kind of military activity that's not peace and not war. It's somewhere in the middle. But I think the scope of the Mabam, this campaign, and uh, the influence it has had on the region is, is truly remarkable. And it has resulted um, in, in becoming the go-to tool uh, for the Israeli defense establishment. And it enables uh, Israel to maintain its routine on the one hand and disrupt uh, a lot of the activities that it finds troubling on the other. So it's really become a, a flagship project. Thank you. So I, I have just two two last questions. The first question is actually, uh, you, ladies and gentlemen, just remember, we started dealing with those entities that are on Israel's border, with whom Israel shares a, a border. Then we pulled back the lens, as I said we would, and we spoke about Afghanistan and Iran and the UAE and Saudi Arabia. And then we've moved on a little bit to the uh, United States of America and Iran. And now I want to talk about the the power struggle that's afoot uh, between the United States and China as it pertains to Israel and as it pertains to Iran. And Yochai, you wrote a paper for us that dealt with this very issue. And I would encourage everyone to read it on your page on the commentary section of the Miriam Institute website. And it's to do with China now holding the key to whether or not Iran gains nuclear weapons capabilities. So tell us about why it is that you felt the Iranians may look to China as a reliable uh, ally in this fight and why China may actually rebuff the Iranians a little bit, not wishing to overplay its hand in the region. And what that means for Israel, because, of course, what China does, America watches very, very closely. Well, when we look at the JCPOA, it came about because Iran needed to sell its oil, because it needed to get out of sanction. And the only way to do so was to uh, get a deal with the the U.S. and Europe, because Europe was the one that uh, would be investing in uh, Iran and buying its oil and the U.S. will be the one that will lift the sanctions and allow Iran uh, to export its oil. But what is happening right now is that uh, when Iran looks around and sees who's going to buy my oil for the next 20 years and who's going to invest in uh, in the country for the next 20 years, it's not seeing Europeans, it's not seeing the Americans, it's seeing Chinese. Uh, it sees the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, it sees uh, the thirst for Iranian oil and Iranian gas that uh, even now sustains uh, uh, Chinese uh, attempts and not just attempts, but, but, but action to subvert uh, the American sanctions and buy uh, Iranian crude uh, vis-a-vis 
unscrupulous ways. Uh, so Iran, when it looks to the future, says, hey, my future is with China. And by the way, China is uh, the great rival of the United States. That's a bonus. And, uh, and when you look at Chinese uh, uh, way of governance, it's really one that uh, really uh, complements uh, the one of uh, Iran. And there won't be pressures to on, on humanitarian issues, human rights and, uh, and uh, other changes. So China looks really, really good uh, when uh, it looks from, uh, from Tehran. Uh, but uh, China, on the other hand, uh, sees that uh, most of its crude is coming from Saudi Arabia and the UAE. And uh, it's not uh, so uh, uh, mm -hmm. a bit reluctant to go all in on, on Iran. Uh, there are a lot of other players rich players in, in the region, which is wants to, uh, to make uh, them come into its uh, area of influence. So uh, China's looking uh, at it a bit, a bit differently than Iran, and I don't think it will be uh, so thrilled uh, to walk uh, uh, towards Iran, to run towards uh, the Iranian arms. Um, this makes China a very important player because uh, I think uh, that the way that you can influence Iran is by making it understand that there will not be any future to its uh, endeavors if it goes nuclear, and the one that holds its future is China. So make China, make them understand. You know, we, we've started this conversation, and it's about the geostrategic positioning of the state of Israel. Uh, the reality is that the fulcrum of the positioning of the states of Israel in any sense, whether it be geostrategic, whether it be its relations with the diaspora, anything to do with it, the fulcrum of that, of course, is, is the state of Israel itself. And we're into a new government. We're into a post-Bibi Netanyahu era. Assess for us how the government is doing. How, how's the coalition holding one of the questions that I have is whether or not you feel, and Yochai, I'm going to ask you to wade in on this as well, both of you briefly, if you would. One of the questions that I have is whether or not Prime Minister Bennett has the necessary gravitas, quite frankly, to represent, is, represent Israel's interests abroad in the way that we saw Prime Minister Netanyahu do. Uh, full disclosure, I'm one of the individuals who actually protest voted whenever I was on the ground at home in Israel protest voted against uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, and I, I did that since 2014, since Operation Protective Edge, uh, an operation into which I was drafted, and two of my brothers were drafted as well. Uh, so I'm not asking this question as somebody who necessarily laments the departure of Benjamin Netanyahu, although I do credit him for his achievements while in situ, of course. Uh, but I, I don't think anybody can take away from him his ability to represent Israel on the international stage. Uh, does Prime Minister Bennett have the gravitas and the sophistication to fill those shoes? Does he want to fill those shoes? And also, does he have the requisite strength and mastery of the coalition, not only to represent Israel's interests abroad, but also to reconnect with the diaspora, something that he's affixed as a key initiative of his, uh, and any other aspects of governance uh, that have global implications, international implications that you might like to touch upon. What, what are your thoughts there, Yaakov, briefly? And then, Yochai, I'd love to hear from you. And don't feel that you have to limit your responses exclusively to the prime minister. Obviously, feel free to broaden that to the foreign minister and anybody else that you like. So one of the things I think is interesting to point out here is when we're talking about geostrategic links and strategic alliances, of course, the United States is number one here for Israel. And one of the good things here is that it doesn't matter who, who the prime minister or the president is. The defense establishments have a working relationship that goes deeper than the ups and downs, the diplomatic ups and downs between government. We saw that uh, in past administrations, in the past governments. And that's one of the answers to the question in terms of the strategic implications of uh, the ability to represent Israel to the United States in a, in, a, in a good way. I think the most important aspect of that relationship is 
between the defense establishments and the strategic uh, relationship. And that is uh, deeper than uh, the current political situation in either country. And of course, it's influence, but I think it's important to put that on the table, that it's really an anchor of the alliance and, and, and it's independent in many ways of the political ups and downs. Um, in terms of uh, uh, the political situation itself, I think that what Bennett really represents in this country um, to those who are willing to give him a chance, to those who uh, um, have welcomed the change, is the idea of some sort of unity and the ability to get around these uh, um, major divisions, which many of them can, could really be, you know, uh, boiled down to uh, BB yes or no. You know, in, in the end, so many of these questions came down to BB yes or no, and, and the country was so split. Um, and paralyzed politically and unable to form a government after successive rounds of elections, that just the ability to form a functioning government that's apparently about to pass a budget and which includes the left, the center, the right, um, an, an Arab party, all of these components, this represents an ability to at least govern. And we didn't have that uh, for, for quite a while. Um, so in that respect, I think many here uh, see it as welcome. And, and there's another camp here which views the government as illegitimate. You know, we can't ignore that. There's a camp in this country that views the current government as illegitimate. So uh, the divisions haven't gone away, but we do have a functioning government. Uh, how well it's able to represent itself to uh, allies and particularly the United States, I think it's too early uh, to make determinations. It's simply too early. Time will tell. But the good news from my perspective is that the defense uh, uh, alliance and, and the relationship between the militaries and the intelligence agencies is excellent and independent of, of many of the governments that are in power. Yochai, what's your thought? Same, same issue, if you would. I would add just one thing. I would think that because of the, I would say even... The close, uh, the close connection between Prime Minister Netanyahu and uh, former President Trump would have made it, would have made Israel even more of a political, in, inter-American political issue had uh, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu uh, still been in power. If uh, progressives uh, blocked uh, uh, the Iron Dome uh, defense um, financing to Israel uh, now, and they got a bipartisan uh, uh, a rejection of that uh, uh, attempt. If that would have been Benjamin Netanyahu on the other hand, and with the relations that he had with the Democrats, with Biden, with President Obama, I think that would have been far, the implications and the Act from the American side would have been far greater. Um, it, it, he holds uh, 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 and it, his connection with Do Donald Trump holds something to the American electorate, to American uh, progressives, and it might have been um, influencing their decision making, how to pressure Israel on issues such, such as China, such as the Palestinians. And the fact that Bennett is new and he is not BB, uh, I think provides him with some leeway on that issue. So there's just a, a quick question I'm going to take from the audience. Uh, the question is, where can you place Russia in the context of Israel's geostrategic position? It's quite remarkable when one thinks about the Yom Kippur War, which we commemorated, whereby the state of Israel was, was literally thought of as a, as a mere proxy uh, mm -hmm. in, the, in the great power struggle between then the Soviet Union and the United States of America. And in the intervening years, uh, the state of Israel looks eyeball to eyeball directly with Vladimir Putin to talk about its own destiny in its own name, and it can assign its own red lines, and Russia will understand that those red lines are not to be crossed. So that's another example of the, the absolutely unfathomable coming to pass. And and being suddenly mm -hmm. worthy of appreciation and, 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 and acknowledgement. So it uh, shows you how Israel is rising uh, and continues to rise in, in the region. We 
you would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, Post Office Box 360, Stamford, Connecticut 06904. Or you can call the JBS Pledge Line at 833-MY-JBS-TV. That's 833-695-2788. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. We thank you for your kind support.